Amen. So when I was in fifth grade, we uh, we planned this big vacation. So my dad took off work. He went put down payments on this on this nice resort with a you know the pool and the water slide and the golf course out back and just all these activities, all this fun stuff to do. And so um, we, we we get in the car and we go to we go to Phoenix. It was in Arizona, so we all packed up the car. We went on this road trip to Phoenix, and um, so. We get there, we start having fun, we, we golf, we go in the pool, we go shopping, all that kind of stuff that you do on vacation. Um, then one night we were at dinner and my dad got a call, one call that you don't really ever want to get. And uh, it was a call from my grandma, from, from his mom, and it said that my uh, great grandma had died. So his grandma had died. And so that whole family's in Alabama. So we're in Arizona right now, which is not really that close to Alabama, but um, she had her funeral and everything like that. So we were like, all right, we cut this vacation short. We were like two days into our, our, our big long vacation and we realized that we couldn't, we couldn't stay there anymore. So we packed up the car again and we left from Arizona, drove all the way to Alabama. And uh, so that's a long road trip. I've done the Kentucky road trip quite a few times in Alabama. It's just as far, if not farther. Um, and so this exciting vacation that we had, this resort vacation at this, you know, really cool place that we were going to be at in Arizona, it was all, it was all really for nothing. Our, our plans changed. So that, that trip, I wouldn't even really call it a vacation. That trip that we took from Arizona to Alabama was a completely different kind of trip. I mean, it wasn't really vacation. I mean, it technically was, but not really because the reason we were going is to go to this funeral of my, of my great grandma. So instead of, you know, the long, you know, cool resort or, you know, the long, you know, few weeks at the resort, it was like one night, you know, hotel in like El Paso, Texas. I don't know if you know where El Paso is. Has anyone heard of El Paso before? So we stopped in El Paso. El Paso is literally a stone's throw from, uh, from Mexico. Um, so we, we're, at, we're, at, uh, we're in El Paso. It's a really sketchy, really sketchy place. You can literally see from our hotel room, you can look over the wall. So insert your wall joke here. Um, we could see over the wall into Mexico, into actually the most dangerous city in all of Mexico is that city right there, um, Ciudad Juarez. And so anyway, our, our, our insane vacation to Phoenix, it turned into a night in El Paso. And then we had a night in Tucson, which my parents went to school there at uh, Arizona, University of Arizona, and they think it's cool, but that place is a dump. I mean, like, like I feel safer in Santa Ana than I did in Tucson. I'll just put it that way. Like it wasn't even close to Mexico, but I, st I like it was it was just kind of a scary place then we went to like uh we stopped in like uh San Antonio which is I guess a little cooler but these are all like one night like one night at this hotel so that we can go to Embassy Suites so we can get our omelets in the morning from the free omelet bar and then head on to Montgomery Alabama and Montgomery it's not really that cool either there's nothing really to see there um they're they're they have a baseball team there in Montgomery um it's not an MLB team. It's like a triple-A AA or double-A team. And their, their team name is literally the Montgomery Biscuits. Like, that's literally their team name. So this is what you got in Montgomery. You can go to, like, go to Cracker Barrel. You go see the Biscuits play, you know, baseball. And um, anyway, so this trip, it turned, it, it kind of turned for the worse. I mean, not, not only did my great-grandma die, I didn't really know her that well. Um, that I mean, I'm still sad that she was still my great-grandma. But, but the whole mood of that trip, the whole focus of that trip, it was just, it was completely different. It wasn't vacation anymore. It was, we're going to a funeral for my grandma. And the focus of any trip, any kind of trip you take, the, the focus dictates what happens on that trip and the mood of that trip. You know, a business trip is completely different than a vacation. Uh, a, a funeral trip is completely different than a business trip or a, you know, a vacation. You go to Washington, D.C., that trip is going to look really different than if you go to Hawaii. Hawaii, you go sit on the beach, you go chill out, you know, you have a good time. D.C., you're like, you're like walking like 500 miles a day, going to this museum to that museum to all these attractions and stuff like that. So when you're on vacation or you're on, you're on a trip, the focus, the different kind of focus, it, it dictates how that vacation goes. Just the same thing in life. In life, if you're focused on one thing, the, the, whatever your focus is, it, it matters. If you have a negative focus, then whatever you're doing, that's going to be negative. If you've got a positive focus, it's going to be positive. And you know, prayer, it's, it's actually no different. You've got to have the right focus. There's a wrong focus and there's a right focus in prayer. There's a good focus and there's a bad focus. And if you, your focus will actually affect the way that you pray. And I'm sure a lot of you guys, you guys pray. 
um, or I, I hope you pray, and your prayers look like just going to God for request after request after request. We were in small groups, and I liked what, what Noah said in small groups. He said, it's like we go to God like he's a vending machine, like our vending machine prayers. And I thought that was a good picture of what sometimes we treat prayer as. It's just a vending machine. We go to God, God, give me this. God, give me that. God, give me straight A's. God, give me a win today in my basketball game. God, help me this. Help me that. Help me this. Do this for me. Heal my grandma. You know, all these different things that we go to God and we ask him. And that's the wrong focus. That's the self-centered focus. The focus is on and the wrong, the wrong place, and that ultimately dictates what, what, how the prayer goes. So we want not the bad focus. We don't want the self-centered focus. We actually want a different kind of focus, a positive, good focus, a God-centered focus in our prayers. And the Bible, it, it lays out how we should have God, God-centered prayers. All throughout the Bible, we read these godly people praying, and it's, it, all, all of their prayers are God-focused. They're, they're God-glorifying requests. That they're praising God for who He is. And so we want to have that kind of prayer life. We want to have a God-centered prayer life. So we got part two of our, of our series here, Pray Like a Pro. We want to answer that question right there. What do I pray for? And, and ultimately, how, what are the right things to pray for? What are the God-centered things to pray for? So that's what we're going to answer here today. So if, you, so if you would, open up to Colossians chapter 4 here with me. We're going to look at three different things that, uh, that Paul kind of lays out here for us in Colossians uh, 4, verse 2 through 4. Three different things, three, three different prayer requests, pr- three different God-centered prayer requests, if you will. Colossians chapter 4, look at it with me on your phone, look at it with your Bible. I want you to actually look at it right now and not just sit there and stare into space. I want you to look at it here. Colossians chapter 4, look at verse 2. It says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. And at the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison, that I may make it clear which I ought to speak. Last week, we talked about that first part in, in, in verse 2. We talked about continuing steadfastly in prayer. We talked about what it means to be watchful in our prayers. So today, I want to talk about verse 2c, if you will, that very end, the, with thanksgiving, and verse 3 and 4 here together. And you see what Paul here, he starts with praying. He says, I want you to continue steadfastly in prayer. I want you to be disciplined. We said we want to be disciplined and we want to be alert in our prayers, like we talked about last week. But he says, how, do, how should we pray? Well, the first thing he says, we got to pray with thanksgiving. We got to pray with, with praise. We got to start with that. So I want you to write that down for one. Start with praise. What do we pray for? We got to start with thanking God or praising God or worshiping God. God in our prayers. It's got to be the theme of our prayers. If we're saying we want God-centered prayers, then really what are we doing? We got to center our prayers on God if we break down what God-centered means. So who are we talking about when we pray? We're talking about God. We can't, we got to run from that vending machine way of praying. Like we said last week, prayer, it's a, it's an opportunity. It's a relationship builder between you and God. Every relationship that you have in your life with your mom, with your friends, with uh, your mom and your friends, I guess that's all the friends you have, right? Your mom and your friends. Um, so any relationship you have, you have to have communication. We always say that you got to talk to God, you got to hear from God. You got to hear from him from your word, you got to talk to him in prayer. And so if prayer is a relationship, picture your prayer life in the terms of a real, physical, human-on-human relationship. Think about your prayers. Think about what you're actually saying to God. What if you treated your friends like that? Like I said earlier, you probably pray, hey, God, give me this, give me that, give me, you know, help me with this, help me get good grades on that. What if that's the way you treated your friends? Or what if I treated Karina like that? What if I said, I came home and I was just like, do my dishes, make me food, clean my room, do my laundry, just do, do, do all this stuff for me. And I never had like a sit down, and have a real conversation with her about life. You'd be like, what, a, you're a, you're a jerk. I mean, that's not how you're supposed to have a relationship with anyone, let alone your wife. You got to talk about things. You got to build a relationship. You're not just asking, do this, do that. But that's sometimes the way that we treat our prayers, telling God, hey, do this, do that. So what do we want to do? We want to start with praise. What do we want to do? We want to reflect on what God has done for you. Reflect on what God does for you or has done for you. For you. If you remember back in Colossians 1, we, we, we did that series on, on Ichthus. We talked about Jesus. We talked about him being the Christ, him being the Son of God, him being the Savior. And we, we looked at that in Colossians 1. 
And so to start with praise, to start with thanksgiving, you've got to reflect on what God has done for you. Look back at Colossians 1. Look back at verse 15. Talking about Jesus, let, let, let's, let's put this in, in the words of a prayer. You say, God, you, you're Jesus, you are the, the image of the invisible God. You're the firstborn of all creation. For by you, all things were created in heaven and on earth. You go, you go through this. You talk about him creating all things. You, you talk about Christ holding all things together, being the head of the body of the church. Then you look down at verse 21. We remember this sermon. Verse 21, you who were once alienated, hostile in mind, you were doing evil deeds. God, you have now reconciled me in the body of, uh, of Christ's flesh by his death in order to present me as holy and blameless and above reproach before you. You change those pronouns around and now it starts to look like a prayer. You reflect on what, what has God done for you and now you reflect that in your prayers. You see that, like I said, the theme, the aroma, the smell of your prayers should be thanksgiving. Have you ever smelled someone that like smells really bad? You ever done that before? You smell someone that's really, it smells really bad? My apartment complex smells really bad. Like there's some people in there that like smell really bad. Not Josh, not Josh. Josh lives there, uh, not with me. That Josh does not live with me. Um, but that's kind of weird. Um, but there's so many people in my apartment complex that smell terrible. You don't really want to be around those people that smell terrible, Right? They give off a, a stenchy aroma that's not, not very good. We want our prayers to have a pleasing aroma to God. And when we have those vending machine prayers, those, God, give me this, give me that, the aroma of our prayers, it's like body odor. It's, it's kind of stinky. God doesn't just want to hear you call out all of these requests without first stopping and acknowledging who he is and what he's done for you. I know the girls looked at a couple weeks ago, Philippians 4, verse 6. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, it says, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. The idea here is your request, even the things you ask God for, it's all got to be in this, ar- in this aroma, in this realm, uh, in this theme of, of thanksgiving. You see, we got to be thanking God more when we pray. I want you to turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 with me here. Open up your Bibles if you haven't already. Open up your phone. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. I want you to see Paul right here. Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14. That's, that's, I can't do math on the spot. That's a handful of verses. That's 10, like 12, or I don't know. What is, what, 14 minus 3? That's 11, right? Plus 1 because it's actually there. Okay, so that's, what, 12? Yeah, math. We're in a math classroom. Yes, I haven't taken math since high school, so good for, good for me. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, no, verse 3 through 14, that's 12 verses. This is one sentence. It's not one sentence in your English Bible, but in the Greek, it's literally one sentence because Paul, he's just going on and on and on about how great God is. He's blessing God. He's praising God. This is how he, this is how he starts this book. This is literally one sentence. This is the longest run-on sentence of all time. It says, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who who's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He chose us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Christ Jesus. He goes on and on and on about this inheritance in verse 11. It talks about the hope that we have in Christ in verse 12. It talks about the, the, the word of truth in verse 13, the gospel of salvation, the promise of the Holy Spirit. He goes on and on and on, praising God, thanking God, blessing God for what he has done for him. It's a steady theme throughout this this prayer right here, throughout this ramble that that, that Paul goes through. That looks very different than probably our prayers. You bow your head immediately, God, give me this, help me with that, do this for me. That's a vending machine. This is, this is what Paul's trying to say. Is what, what does a real prayer look like? It looks like talking about God first, reflecting on who he is, reflecting on what he's done for you. You see, God hates ungratefulness. God hates when people are not thankful. If you remember that story of Jesus healing the 10 lepers, you guys remember that story? Jesus, there are these 10 lepers that come up to him and say, Jesus, can you heal us? We need you. We've got leprosy. They've got this skin disease where they can't even come into the temple because they're unclean. Every time someone walks by, they have to yell, hey, I'm unclean, I'm unclean, so that people don't even come close to them. It's a terrible, terrible disease. And so 10 of these guys, they come up to Jesus in Luke uh, 17. They say, hey, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And then Jesus saw him, he said, go now, show yourself to the priest. And when he said that, 
they were cleansed. So then they all leave. And then it says one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell at the face of Jesus' feet, giving thanks to him. He was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered him, we're not ten cleansed. Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. You see, Jesus does this miraculous thing by healing them with a, with a word. Instantly, he heals these 10 guys of this crazy disease that was literally untreatable. Like there wasn't any, there wasn't any medicine for it back in the day. Like this is like if you have it, you're stuck with it. Jesus heals them in an instant. Their lives are changed in an instant. And only one guy, a Samaritan, who, who's, like a, who's a foreigner in the, in the eyes of the, the Jews, they're, they're bad guys. He's the only, there's only one of the nine to come back and Jesus is really mad. He says, we're not 10 cleansed, where are the other nine? Jesus shows this undeserving mercy on these, on these 10 guys who didn't deserve it. He heals 10 of them and one of them comes back. He's angry at that. He's upset. He doesn't even, re- look, he doesn't really rejoice at the Samaritan coming back. He's mad that the nine others didn't come back. See, I don't know if you've ever given a gift to someone an expensive gift to someone and they haven't like said thank you in return. Like I'm not a parent, so I know that that happens when you're a parent like every day of your life. Um, but I've given gifts before. I've told you the story about my brother. I gave him this hat one day uh, for his birthday and uh, I gave it to him. I was like, here, man, here's your birthday present. This really cool hat for you. Um, and he was like, eh, okay, have it back. And he literally tossed it back at me. I gave him this, this hat I went to the store. I literally drove to the mall to buy this hat for him. I bought it with my hard-earned cash, and I went and I gave it to him, and he was like, no, he just tossed it back at me. And I was like, dude, come on, man. And I felt, I, I, I felt awful at that point. I went and spent money on him. I went to the store. I went and gave him this gift, and he literally tossed it back at me. And I imagine it wasn't that much money. It was like, I don't know, 20, 30 bucks, something like that. So it's not a big deal. But imagine if this was like, I, I like unloaded my savings account for him. Like I gave him everything I had. Like I don't have a dollar to my name anymore. I gave him everything. You know, not that I have like a ton of money, but like what I do have, like I, I, I'd rather not just throw it out on a gift. And imagine if he just tossed that back at me and didn't say thanks, didn't appreciate it. Now that makes it much worse. And did Jesus by coming, him coming to die, did he just, is that like 20, 30 bucks to him? No, no, he what? He died on the cross. He spent his whole life. Not even spent his whole life, but then he died so that you could have new life. And to be ungrateful for that, to, to not thank him for that, it's, it's even worse than my brother throwing my hat back at me. Which, funny story, now he wants it back, and now he has it back. So, after all that, I guess he does have it. So, I don't know, you could talk to him about that, but that was a jerk move to toss that hat back at me. But it's a jerk move for us to do the same to God when God has given us everything and we don't go back and we thank him. We're not grateful for what he's given us. And I don't know if you ever prayed for something and God has answered and you don't go back and pray again. I sometimes think about it like, um, so you're praying and you pray for, I don't know, you pray for an hour or whatever about God, would you help me with this? And then he answers. And then you pray for like a minute. Like, oh, thanks. Like, just think about just the egregious nature of you praying so long for this. I need this. God, help me with this. He answers. And then you just pray for like that much. You're like, oh yeah, thanks. Or maybe you don't do it at all. Like, do you see how brutal, how offensive that is to God? It's like a slap in the face. If you're reading the the EDW with us, yesterday we read Psalm 71. Psalm 71, he talks about David here. He's talking about, God, please rescue me, deliver me. He says, deliver me from the hand of the wicked, from the the grasp of the unjust and the cruel men. God, you are my hope and my trust. That's early on in in the psalm. And then at the very end of the psalm, he says, I will hope continually and I will praise you yet more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts and of your deeds and of your salvation all the day. 
Oh God, from my youth you have taught me and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. You see that David does what you're supposed to do when you pray. You pray, you ask God for something and then he answers it. Now you're thankful for him. Now you're acknowledging that he so graciously gave you whatever he gave you. So you're sitting here like, okay, great, cool, man. Like that's, that's awesome. Like I thank God. Okay, what do I actually say? What do I actually thank God for? Sometimes you think, okay, like Thanksgiving or something like that. You're talking about being thankful and you're like, oh yeah, yeah, thanks for like, you know, my family and like the house I'm in and thanks for, I don't know, air. Like, I don't know. You're just like, you're like grasping for what do I even thank God for? Well, can you turn over to Psalm 103 with me real quick? Psalm 103. Hopefully this is a familiar Psalm to you. If it's not, then you haven't been listening because I have preached it before, so joke's on you. Psalm 103, David, he's going off about all the great things that God has given him. And I think this is a great list right here that we can copy. This is not school where copying is a bad thing. It's a good thing in Christianity to copy what the Bible says so that we can copy this prayer right here. Psalm 103, look at David. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul. He's talking to himself. He's commanding himself. Hey, David, bless the Lord, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And right here, he gives you five different things, five things that you can praise God for. Verse three, it says, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all of your disease, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. There are five things right here, five things benefits that, that, that David talks about right here and he's praising God for. First thing he says is forgiving all your iniquity. You can praise God for your forgiveness. If you're a Christian, you got to think about your sin and how, 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 how expensive that sin is and how expensive that cost was for Jesus to die on the cross for your sin. You got to praise God. Hey, if you got nothing else to say, God, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for forgiving me for all of my sins, but thank you for forgiving me for that sin that I did yesterday that I confessed and I said, God, would you please forgive me of this? And he did. God, thank you for forgiving me of that sin right there. God, thank you for healing all my diseases. The next thing David says, maybe, I don't know, healing all your diseases, that sounds kind of shallow. Like, why is David talking about his diseases right now? Like, did he have, you know, did he have cancer? And he's like, he's back or whatever. Like, what happened? Basically, what David is trying to say here is healing your diseases. He's basically saying, hey, if you can read this, if you can hear my words right now, it means you're alive. So it means that in essence, you have been healed from all your diseases. Maybe you're sick. Maybe you have something right now. I don't know. But you can say, hey, God, I am alive right now and thank you for my life. Thank you for sustaining me this long. What is it, March 31st, 2019? You you were never guaranteed March 31st of 2019. That was never guaranteed for you. But God so graciously gave it to you. Praise God for your life. Next thing he says, praise God for for redeeming your life from the pit. We could put this under the realm of salvation. God, thank you for for forgiving me of my sin, for, for showing mercy on me, even though I deserved hell, even though I should be paying for my sin. God, thank you for forgiving me of that. Now I can experience your your blessing instead. Think about the payment. Like we said earlier, the forgiveness. Think about what your sin should have brought you. It should have brought you the pit right here. Redeems your life from the pit. He saves you from that. Next thing he says, he crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. God doesn't just forget about you once you get saved. He says, okay, you're saved. I don't really care about you anymore. You're fine. You're good. You don't need anything else. No, he crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. He blesses you continually. He gives you the word. He gives you prayer. Think about all the blessings you have. If you're a Christian, the last thing he says is he now satisfies you with good so that youth is renewed like the eagles. He fulfills you. We've been talking about this for a long time. That the prodigal son, the prodigal son, what does he do? He runs away. He goes and he eats out of a pig trough thinking that the pig trough will fill him up. He thinks that that's like gonna lead to life, his pig trough. But then the prodigal son, he realizes what he's doing. He turns back, he goes to the father and now he gets a feast thrown for him. So he goes from this fulfillment in pig 
pig food to now he can have real fulfillment in a real feast food and now he can live in this house forevermore. Now he's a son again. There's fulfillment in Christianity. We say this all the time. You going after sin, you going after popularity, you going after whatever it is, your, your sinful passion, you going after that is just going to lead to more and more dissatisfaction. You're going to be unsatisfied. Every time you act on that sexual impulse and you think that that will fill you up, what does it do every single time? It drops, it drops you like your, it, it drops you even worse than you started. It crushes you. You think it's, it's good to cheat on that, on that homework assignment because then you can finish your homework and you can get back to playing video games. Well, guess what happens when you cheat? and you get found out, guess what? Would it be better for you to spend that extra 15 minutes and finish that homework? Or would it be better for you to, to cheat and then get in trouble from that? Sin doesn't satisfy. But right here, David says, I'm satisfied with good because I've got a relationship with God. Now he, my youth is renewed like the eagles. Now he gives me everything that I need. Praise God for the fulfillment that you can have in Christ. So what are you going to do? You're going to go home. You're going to, next time you go pray, you know, you, you set your goal for your FaceTime prayers. You, you want to pray for, I don't know, five minutes a day. That's your, your low bar. You want to pray for five minutes. Okay, what do you start with? Do you start with those vending machine requests or do you start right here with point number one? You start with praise. You start with thanksgiving. You know, when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray in the Lord's Prayer, he started with our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. He doesn't say, start off with, give me this day my daily bread. No, he starts off with, oh Father, or our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. He praises God. Jesus models what real prayer looks like and it starts with praise. It starts with thanksgiving. Don't just immediately jump into your prayers and go into those requests. Stop. Start with thanksgiving. Start with praise. Then if you're having trouble, which if you ever had trouble in prayer, I've, I've had trouble in prayer. You, you don't know what to pray next. Sometimes what I will do is I will literally, I'll put my AirPods in and I will just turn a worship song on. And think about the songs we just sang right now. Your love awakens me. You think you put, the, you put those words and that melody in your head and that doesn't help you pray? I mean, that every worship song you have, it's literally a prayer. That's, that's what it is. It's a prayer to music. And so what I would do sometimes is I'm having trouble praying and I just put a worship song in and I just, I don't sing it out loud because I'm not weird. I, I guess I am weird, but I'm not that weird. But some people do and some people do. And if you have your own room, you could do it. But I shared a room with my brother. So that'd be kind of weird if I just started like singing and he's like sitting right there sleeping or something like that. So I will just, I will think about the words and I will sing them in my own head and I will, I will, I will pray those words. God, your love awakens me. God, it awakens me. Awaken me from my sin. Now, now, now I see your goodness. Now I was blind, but now I see. God, thank you for that. Your love it, it has now awakened me. And I use those worship songs to aid my prayers. So if you're stuck, use worship songs to aid your prayers. So you got to start with it. If you get stuck, you got to turn on a worship song and use that to help you. That's what you got to start with. So what else do you pray? Do you just stop there? No, no, no. Paul, he's got some requests for you. He gets, he's got some God-centered requests here for you. What else should you pray? Look back at Colossians chapter 4. Seriously, pull out your phones. I know some of you guys are sitting there playing on your phones on Instagram or screenshot and stuff. Like seriously, look at the Bible right now. Colossians chapter 4. Don't just sit there. Look at Colossians 4. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. That's the aroma of your prayers. It's thankfulness. It's worship. It's praise. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account with which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which I ought to speak. Paul, he specifically asked them, hey guys, please, Colossians, please pray for me. Pray for my ministry right here. What he's praying here is God, or not God, he's saying Colossians, pray with me so the gospel would go forth, so that God would open a door to declare the, the, the mystery of Christ, to declare the gospel to lost people, and that they, pray that they would get saved is what he's asking for here. 
You know, it seems odd. Is that like the second thing I pray for? I pray for the gospel to go forth. I pray for, you know, people to get saved. I pray for the ministry or whatever. Well, I would say yes. That's what Paul says right here. You know, if you go further on in the, in the Lord's Prayer, what does he say? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Immediately, he talks about the kingdom. He talks about the gospel going forth. This is something you need to be praying about. Praying for God to save people. And where is he going to save people? Well, I would argue he's going to save people at the church. So I wouldn't tell you, hey, pray for Paul's ministry because Paul's dead. But I would say pray for the church's ministry. Point number two, write that down. Pray for the church's ministry. Paul is asking for prayer for his ministry. I would say, hey, start praying for the ministry of the church. Point number two. God cares chiefly about his kingdom. He cares chiefly about people getting saved. Ultimately, this is what you need to be praying about. Praying that God would save people through the church, through the gospel. You see, God, this is what he cares about. And if we want to have God-centered prayers, if we want to have prayer requests that reflect God's prayer requests, we want to pray things that God wants us to pray for. This is one of them right here. 2 Peter 3.9, it says that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some counsel is, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. God, he cares about people getting saved. Is this something that you care about? If you're a Christian, you're saying, I want to follow Christ. Okay, guess what? That means, that means your prayers got to follow Christ too. That means that you got to be praying for stuff like this. You got to be praying that people would get saved. You're praying for the ministry of the gospel. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so Paul, he's asking, hey guys, please pray for an open door. What is he talking about? An open door. Well, basically what he's saying is pray for opportunities so that I can share the gospel, so that, so that people would, would know it. And guess what? I think I can be confident that the Colossians probably prayed for this. I mean, Paul, he, he literally, he wrote this letter to them. I'm sure that at least some of them said, okay, I will take this prayer request seriously and I will pray for Paul, write down Philippians 1, verse 12 through 14. This is an answer to this prayer right here. In Colossians, he's in prison. In Philippians, he's in prison. Philippians 1, 12 through 14, he says, I want you to know, brothers, what has happened to me, a.k.a. that I've been in prison, it has really served to advance the gospel. It has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest of all of my imprisonment, or, or and to, to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. What he's saying right here is, you guys pray for me. You pray for open doors. You pray for opportunities. Paul is saying, hey, God, answer those prayers. This is the prayer that God wants to answer. Paul's saying, God's saying, Jesus is saying that if you pray for something like this, God will answer 100%. John 14, 14, Jesus says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. What is he saying? You literally tack on, hey, Jesus, uh, give me a Ferrari in Jesus' name. Like you tack that on and it's like a for sure, like it works. Like, no, it doesn't work like that. If you've tried, like you've seen, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't. But when Jesus says, ask anything in my name, what he's talking about is you asking for things that Jesus wants to. You're asking for things that are God's and you're asking for things that are God's will. You ask for God to give you opportunities or give the church opportunities to, to share the gospel. You pray that people would get saved. And guess what? God will do it. And so I invite you with me to pray for this church. You pray for this ministry. If this is something that you don't pray about, hey, Owen, can you put your phone away? Thanks. If this is something that you are serious about, I, I hope that you would join me and pray with me for this church. And you need help with that? What do I pray? I just pray, hey God, help Compass. Help Compass Tustin to do good things. Help Compass Tustin to preach the gospel. I think that's a good start, but there's this little book that, of all people, I guess my dad wrote it, so my name's on it. Uh, on the back, actually. Thanks. Um, it's this little, it's lit, man, 30 pages. No, 20, 27, not including the table of contents. So there you go, 27-page book that I'm going to leave in the back. It's called Praying for Sunday. It's literally a book about how to pray for your church, how to pray for the preacher. 
um, how, how to pray for me or how to pray for Pastor Elliot. This book lays out what you can specifically pray for. So I'm going to leave. I've got like a handful of those. I'm just going to leave them in the back with the snack. But you can pick one up if you need help. Okay, I don't know how to do point number two. What do I actually pray for? Well, right here in this book, it lays out, I mean, different things. Like you're praying for, let's see, you're praying for people to show up at a preaching event. You're praying for people to arrive in the right frame of mind. You're praying for... Um, for God to protect the preaching from any distractions, or I pray that the gospel would be um, proclaimed clearly, or different things like this. This book is really helpful, really, really helpful on, on what, what to do, how to actually pray for your church, how to actually pray for the preacher. My daddy made an acronym back in the day. Uh, it was for an Easter service. And he said, I want you to pray for four things. And so if you pick up this book or if you don't pick up this book, he said, pray for four things when it comes to, you know, a preaching event or, or your church's ministry. The first thing, uh, it, it was an acronym for, uh, we used to do Easter, or AV used to do Easter, um, Easter at the Bren, at the Bren Center at UCI. We used to like pack that, pack that big whole gym out, which was, it was pretty, pretty crazy. But anyway, he made an acronym called Bren, like, haha, get it? Um, and so he, he said, pray, pray for four things. We want to pray for, for big, big crowds. We want to pray for a lot of people to show up. That's important that people are there. Um, we should have prayed harder today maybe um, for that. But we want to pray for big crowds, that people show up to actually hear the gospel. We want to pray for receptive hearts. We don't want people to come in closed-minded, not actually in the right frame of mind, just as this book was, was saying. We want to pray for big numbers. We want to pray for, pray for receptive hearts. We want to pray for an effective sermon that God would use the gospel proclaimed. We want, we want him to use that effectively. And the last thing, the end, is we want to pray for new life. We want to pray for big crowds, for receptive hearts, for effective sermon, and for new life. Those are the four main things we want to pray for when it comes to the preaching of the word. Big crowds, receptive hearts, effective sermon, and new life. I, I think about that Bren acronym literally all the time. When I think about Easter, I will pray it for this Easter. I will pray it for, for, for camp, you know. Big crowds, receptive hearts, effective sermon, new life. Don't let this request just fall through the cracks of your vending machine prayer time. You can't treat the church as just this consumer mindset of what can I get out of the church? Your, your thought process needs to be what can I do for the church? How can I serve the church? Maybe it's serving in Awana. Maybe it's serving in kids' class. Maybe it's serving in the, the, the worship or whatever. But you can also serve your church by just praying for it, committing to praying for the church. It's a team aspect. So don't let this request fall through the cracks, but actually commit to praying for your church's ministry. Just like Paul, he asked the uh, Colossians here to pray for. So what's the last thing? I don't see any. What, what's still here? What's still left? We just read it all. What should I pray for? Well, the last thing I think kind of goes along with verses 3 and 4 as well. Paul is asking specifically for prayer for, for him and for his ministry. But I think also a good thing for you to do is start praying for, for your ministry as well. Not your ministry in terms of uh, come to student ministry, but your ministry in terms of you as a person, your, your ministry to people. Write that, down, write that down for point number three. Pray for your ministry. In a couple weeks, we're going to start a new series on evangelism and even some apologetics, learning how to defend the faith to... to uh, non-believers, because that's where we get in our passage. It's not just like the next thing I want to do. It's like literally right there in verses six, five and six. But this is something we need to start praying for right now. God, how can you need to help me do better ministry? And what do I mean by that? Remember, no, remember, I shouldn't even ask that. Last summer, I preached a sermon on us being ambassadors for God. 2 Corinthians 5, we, we, we looked at, therefore we are ambassadors of Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's our job. We are representatives. We are ambassadors of Christ to the world. 
So our mission is to, is to bring that ministry of reconciliation, he says right here, we imploring others on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So if you're an ambassador, you have to look different from the world. You have to act different than the world. You have to speak different from the world. But then you also got to share the gospel to the world. Say, hey, guess what? Like we said back in that sermon, not that you remember, we said, okay, it's like a tsunami's coming. God's judgment is coming. And we are sitting on the beach and there's people on the beach. There's a tsunami coming. You don't just hop in your car, not say a word and drive off. No, no, no. You, guys, guys, everyone stop. Get up. I'm warning you, there's a tsunami coming. Everyone leave, get in the car, go. You don't just think about yourself, or if you do, I guess you're, you're a jerk too. <laughs> um, we gotta be ambassadors. We gotta be representative. Hey, guys, there's something happening. God's judgment is coming. The tsunami is coming. Please come with me. Let's leave. Let's get out of here. That's what an ambassador is. You're representing the boss. You're pleading with others. Just like we talked about a few weeks ago, we talked about St. Patrick. We said St. Patrick, he was compassionate and he was also bold. He was compassionate in, in terms of he cared about the Irish people. He goes there he, to get persecuted and then he pleads with them on behalf of Christ. Hey guys, be reconciled to God. This is the gospel. This is the true way. This is the, the, the one true God. Believe in him and you will be saved. Then he was, he was actively bold and God, he blessed that ministry. He was compassionate and he was bold. We need to Pray that God would help us. God would, would, would open doors for us to do that. Write down Luke 11, 9 and 10. Jesus here, he says, he gives another promise. He says, and I tell you, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. So everyone who seeks, finds. And whoever knocks, it will be open. What Jesus is saying here is, if you ask. Whoa, that was a crazy voice cry. If you ask. I'm still in junior high. If you ask, <clears throat> if you ask something in his name, if you ask something that is a God-centered prayer request, he promises to answer it 100% of the time. You're guaranteed to succeed. And if God is a liar, then maybe we cannot trust it. But guess what? Last time I checked, God isn't a liar. God can only breathe out truth. And when he makes a promise and he says, if you ask, it will be given to you, then I think we need to, start asking, God, help me. Give me boldness. Give me compassion. Help open doors for me to preach the gospel. I like here in this text, it says, don't just ask, but it says, seek and you will find. I think we need to be asking and we need to be seeking. So when you pray for God, give me opportunities to invite friends to church. Give me opportunities to share the gospel to my lost friend. We need to actually be seeking that as well. Remember that I heard this old analogy. It's like me praying right here for this iPad to not fall off the, the, the pulpit here. And if I'm pushing it, I'm like, hey, God, please don't, please don't let the iPad fall off the, the pulpit. Please, please don't do that. But what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm pushing it. Then why would God answer that prayer? Look at that levitation. Man, that's crazy. But do you see, like, if I just pray, hey, God, please, please make sure that this iPad doesn't fall off, and I'm just pushing it and pushing it, pushing it, then that's not really what real prayer is. Prayer is, okay, this is an example. You're not praying for this iPad. But this is an example. I'm praying the iPad doesn't fall off the pulpit. What do I not do? I don't push it off. And guess what? It doesn't fall off. So when you ask for something like this, when you ask, God, open a door you actually have to seek it too. You got to pray, like we talked about last week, you got to pray expectantly, being watchful in your prayers. One eye open when you pray. You can't just pray, hey God, open a door and then you just go to school and you're not looking around for those doors. You got to actually pray for that and then you actually got to keep your eyes up and look for those open doors because I guarantee you, if you pray for it, you will find it if you look. I can personally attest to this. I've, I've had... I've had times where I have committed to praying for God, please open a door for a conversation with, with my boss. Not, not my boss. My boss is Pastor Elliot. He, does, he already has the gospel. But my, my boss, when I was out at school, who's a non-Christian, I, 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 he was a non-Christian. I, I shared the gospel a few times with him. But I remember praying on one day to work, and I said, I don't know what prompted this, but I was like, God, just give me an open door today. Please help me. Just open some door that I would be able to go forth and talk to him about the gospel. And guess what? 
That was the best conversation I've ever had with him that day. Like, it was just weird. I was like, why, why today of all days? Oh yeah, that's right. I committed to praying for it. And God answered that, that prayer. Think about it. You're praying for something that God wants. Why would God reject you? Say, oh God, please help me share the gospel. Oh, God says, nope, don't want you to. Why, why would he do that? He wouldn't, right? Because this is something that God wants to do. So you, you have a ministry at your school and your sports teams. You got to pray for it. Pray that God would give you open doors. Pray that God would give you compassion. Pray God would give you boldness. Commit to praying for your own ministry as well. Pray and then seek also. Ask and then seek. I guarantee you God will answer that. These three things right here, starting with thanksgiving, starting with praise. You start praying for the church's ministry. You start praying for your ministry. Do you think God will answer those prayers right there? Point two and three. You think God will answer those prayers if you ask for those things? I I think he will. Because I think God cares deeply about those two things right there. Especially if you start with praise. If you start with thanksgiving and praise. That's how Jesus starts the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he goes into, give us day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. He starts with what's most important. He starts with praising God. Then he starts for praying for the kingdom to come. A.K.A praying for the church's ministry, praying for your ministry. I guarantee you, if you start praying for those things, God will answer those things 100% of the time. Run from those vending machine prayers and start praying God-centered prayers. God doesn't want to hear your self-centered prayers. He wants to hear and he wants to answer your God-centered prayers. So hopefully you can do that this week. Hopefully you've been praying maybe a little bit more than you did last week. Um, Just even as we start talking about prayer, I just... It always convicts me, man, I need to pray more. I need to pray better. And so I prayed more this week than I did last week just because it's on my mind. So hopefully you're, you're doing that too. And hopefully you're praying for the right things, not self-centered things, but God-centered things. So let's practice right now. Let's pray God-centered requests right now. And let's see if God answers. Let's bow our heads. God, we are so thankful that you are who you are, God. We are thankful that you are a compassionate God. We are thankful that you are a God of mercy and grace. God, even though we were dead in our trespasses, you made us alive together in Christ. By grace, we have been saved. God, is not our own doing. If it was, we wouldn't need to thank you. But it's not our own doing. It's your doing. And so we we, we acknowledge that and we thank you for that. We praise you for saving us, God, for sending your son to, to live in our place, to die in our place, so that we could be made right with you, God. We're so thankful for that. God, as we sit here, reflect on the God-centered things that we should be praying. God, I ask that you would use this church, Compass Bible Church, to us, and you use this student ministry right here, God, to build your kingdom. This is what you care about. This is ultimate. We care about it because you care about it. So God, for your sake, for your name, for your glory, would you hear our prayer and would you answer it? God, save people in this room. Save people in this room. Save people outside of this room that are not in this room yet. God, this is your desire. I pray that you would answer it according to your will in your good pleasure. God, I pray for each one of us as we have our own sphere of influence, our own sphere of ministry. God, I pray that you would help each one of us be bold, help each one of us be compassionate, help each one of us supply those open doors for each one of us, God, so that we can go through those this week. God, supply each person in this room an opportunity this week. Please, God, supply every person in this room an opportunity at least once this week to either share the gospel or have a, have a spiritual conversation and invite someone to church or whatever it is. God, I pray that you would help us and give us those opportunities so that we can declare the mystery of Christ boldly as we ought to speak, just like Paul said. Please help us, God. We believe that these are your requests. We believe that these are God-centered. So please help us and please answer us. In Jesus' name, amen.